So good morning. I hope you all had a great weekend. Uh, really cool to have you here. Today at 1 o'clock, 1.10, uh, turn in the Linear Regression Crystallography Lab. Problem set 5 will be up. We'll talk about it before you turn it in, self-correct, that kind of jazz. The quiz this week is a take-home quiz. You'll get a copy of it, and you'll turn it in next week, Monday, at 1.10. And then we'll go next door and do the Freezing Point Lab. This is a lab where you've got to have safety goggles. We're using real nasty chemicals and stuff like that. Questions on any of that stuff? All right. On Friday, we left off talking about the new type of concentration units we're going to use in this section. And we talked about mole fraction, which was the moles of what you're looking at divided by the total moles. Mole fraction is always a number between 0 and 1. Weight percent or mass percent, which is the grams of what you're looking at, grams of A divided by the total grams. This one is times 100%. Molality, which is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And finally, molarity. Molarity is moles of solute over liters of solution. Molality is the little m. Molarity is the big m. Make sure you don't get those crossed up or anything like that. That would be bad news. Um, I do want to talk about one more type of unit of concentration that you might see more in other classes than here. And it has different names, but the most common one is parts per million. There's also a parts per thousand, which is different than our parts per thousand, and a parts per billion. But if you see parts per million, which is used in biology, uh, sometimes in environmental studies and stuff like that, it's always like one gram of whatever it is, and in terms of parts per million, it would be per million grams of the solvent, all right? And the water, water is almost always the solvent, and because the density is about one gram per milliliter, that would mean one gram of what you're looking at divided by a million grams of water. If you extend that out a little bit, a milligram per liter is roughly one part per million. Uh, when you do the math, it is. And so this is kind of a nice little picture. You can see the effect of parts per million. Um, a lot of the environmental consequences fall around arguments as to how much stuff we can handle in our tap water, for example, or how much pollution you can have. And there's lots of stuff about that. If you had a parts per thousand in this context, it would be one gram per one thousand grams, 10 to the third grams. And you do see parts per billion, sometimes even parts per trillion. A part per billion would be one gram in a billion grams, 10 to the ninth grams. Um, it is different than our parts per thousand, though. Our parts per thousand in lab is how close two trials are to each other. So it's a measure of precision. This is a true concentration, like how much solute there is in a million or whatever grams of solvent. Um, they're just numbers. They're usually called PPM, PPB, stuff like that. But if you see that, just realize it's, it is a type of concentration. We won't use it in this class too much. Uh, and it is different than our parts per thousand, which is how close things are. The vapor pressure of a liquid depends on the ability of the liquid's molecules to break intermolecular forces and escape into the vapor phase. A molecule can escape only when it has enough energy and is at the surface of the liquid. When a non-volatile solute is added to a liquid, some of its molecules occupy surface sites in the liquid, displacing volatile solvent molecules. Because fewer solvent molecules get to the surface, fewer can escape, and the vapor pressure of the solution decreases. In the normal pure liquid, and if you stop the stopper, you're going to have a little bit of pressure over the liquid. And this is what we talked about in the last chapter, it's vapor pressure. And vapor pressure approaches atmospheric pressure, that's when boiling occurs, blah, blah, blah. But it's a natural phenomenon, it goes up with temperature, stuff like that. If you have a solute, and especially a solute that isn't volatile itself, like ionic compounds or, or big covalent molecules, then uh, the ionic the uh, solute molecules literally act like bouncers. <laughs> and on Friday, it was talking about being at a nightclub, which I never go to, so I'm not the best person, but bouncers will control who goes in and out. And these bouncer solute molecules, 
They don't care if the gas goes down to the liquid, but they prevent some of the liquid going up to the gas. They act like a barrier, okay? So it takes more energy, i.e. a higher temperature, to get the same level of vapor pressure over a solution than it does if you have a pure solvent. So the first of the colligative properties is literally looking at vapor pressure. And this guy named Raoult, was, which I probably am not saying right, was the first one to figure it out. And the equations that's called Raoult's law says that the vapor pressure of the solvent over the solution, that's this thing, is dependent on the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. If you see a little superscript zero, like it's a degree Celsius or something like that, a lot of times in this kind of uh, stuff, it means pure, all right? So this would be pure solvent, and this would be the vapor pressure of the solution. Now, if the solvent is pure, the mole fraction will be one, and the vapor pressure of the pure solvent would equal this number, all right? But in a solution, what happens? Because the mole fraction is going to get smaller as you start adding in solute, this number is going to start going down in a solution. So what it's saying is that the vapor pressure of the pure solvent here compared to this one, this is going to be a smaller number. Those solute molecules are blocking the solvent from going into the gas phase. So they call this sometimes vapor pressure depression, vapor pressure lowering, all right? Because in a solution, the solvent molecules can't get to the gas phase as quickly as they do in a pure solvent. Mathematically, it's very easy to use. And I'll look at an example here in a little bit. Um, but conceptually, it's a little weird. Finding vapor pressure is weird. Just remember, all solvents have a little bit of this pressure over them. And all this is saying is that in a solution, if you had this much, it's lowered down to this much, a smaller amount. So on Friday, we did an example with ethylene glycol, and we went through molality and all this kind of stuff. The mole fraction was 0 0.0672 for the ethylene glycol. And because this is an ethylene glycol uh, water solution, water is the solvent. So in this case, uh, the other day, we solved for the mole fraction of the ethylene glycol. We took the moles of ethylene glycol, mole one divided by this many moles plus the ethylene glycol to get that number. But in Rhodes Law, we want the mole fraction of the solvent. So another thing we talked about on Friday was that all the mole fractions together equal one. So if you have one minus the mole fraction of the solute, you get the mole fraction of the solvent. Little tricks like that can be really helpful. So again, mole fraction of the ethylene glycol, that was for the solute. We want the solvent, so one minus that. And once you have this number, um, there's gonna be some number which is the value of the pure solvent vapor pressure. And you can look this up in tables. Our textbook has one, for example. At 30 degrees Celsius, if you look up the vapor pressure for water, this 31.8 number pops in. And that is the P0. It's the pure vapor pressure value. So at the end of the day, the vapor pressure of the pure solvent is higher than the vapor pressure of the solution. The solution has been lowered. That's what Rhodes Law is all about. And it's lowered by amount proportional to the mole fraction of the solvent. Any questions on that? Okay, so you can do this problem with me or just follow along, either way is fine. But here we have iodine in carbon tetrachloride, all right? Iodine here is the solute, carbon tetrachloride is the solvent. And apparently pure carbon tetrachloride has this vapor pressure at this temperature. The question is what's the vapor pressure of the carbon tetrachloride in the solution? So if you're given like that this value pressure at this temperature, that's the P0, all right? That's gonna be something that's almost always given to you. And so that's the P0. We need the mole fraction of the solvent. So that's gonna be this number divided by the total moles. So this plus this. 
so you can see it's not accidental that 1.96 plus 0.04 is 2. So the mole fraction would be 1.96 divided by 2 essentially times 504. And that number mathematically is 0 0.980, the mole fraction of the solvent. You multiply that by the pure vapor pressure, 494. The answers you get will be smaller than the vapor pressures of the pure solvents. So if you had an answer, say, of 514, like this one right here, something's not right, all right? Because this should be the maximum vapor pressure that you can get for these two. Questions? All right. Sometimes you have not only a solvent which is volatile, but you have a solute. And Donovan, I can't remember, somebody asked me about this on Friday, and um, this is what you would do uh, if you had two uh, compounds and they're both volatile, they both have a vapor pressure. So if you mix two liquids together, this is common. Now we're not going to do a lot of this, but I do want to show you what happens because it does occur. This is mixing of heptane and octane. These are both uh, essentially gasoline constituents and they're both liquids. And we have the mole fraction of the heptane at 0.15. It says calculate the total pressure. So what you do in Reynolds Law is you take the mole fraction of the first one times its pure vapor pressure. Then you add to it the mole fraction of the second one times its vapor pressure. So these are the P zeros, those P numbers. We have the heptane, so this times this number will be like XA times PA. And then because the mole fraction is always equal to 1, 1 minus 0.15 will get you the octane. So 0.85 times 11 will give you the other one. So again, if you have two components, all the mole fractions together are going to equal 1. Just like all of the weight percents will equal 100%, all the mole fractions equal 1. So if you find the mole fraction of the octane, you can then start plugging in those numbers. This is just fun with math. 14.1 torr would be the combined vapor pressure of the mixture. Um, this is something that students that have taken this class later went on and said, oh, I wish I would have known about two component systems with volatile liquids. And I'm like, really? But okay, cool, no problem. So covering my bases, in case you see it yourself. And if you don't, I understand. Too. At 30 degrees Celsius, pure water and a solution of ethylene glycol have nearly the same vapor pressure. As temperature increases, so do both vapor pressures. But when the vapor pressure of water reaches one atmosphere, ethylene glycol is at almost half that. Pure water boils at a significantly lower temperature than does the ethylene glycol solution. Now, if you have a vehicle uh, with a radiator, the vehicles at times need, you can't put water in, but usually people will put ethylene glycol or, or propylene glycol, something like that. And the reason is, is that it changes uh, where the solution boils. So water boils at 100 degrees. Well, if you're on a really hot day or in Arizona or something where it's super hot, uh, that may not work, right? Because it'll start boiling off your water and your car will be kaput. So what they will do sometimes then is use solutions, all right? So the blue line here is pure water. The red line is water plus ethylene glycol, all right? And when you have a solute that's blocking the liquid going to a gas, it's harder for the liquid to start to boil. So for pure water, which is this one right here, at one atmosphere of pressure, that's when water boils at 100 degrees. But if the ethylene glycol is blocking the water from getting to the gas phase, you can see in this red line, it doesn't boil until you get to one atmosphere right here, which is about 115 or so. So an ethylene glycol water solution boils at a higher temperature than the pure water does. And this is another colligative property. It's the same phenomena as we saw with vapor pressure. It's just that this is for boiling points. So we're going to talk a lot here about how solutions have a higher boiling point than the pure solvents they come from. And again, it all goes back to those solute molecules blocking what's happening. 
Uh, this is a phase diagram. The black line would be water. I would diagonalize that a little bit more, but that's okay. Um, anyway, this would be the normal boiling point of water. With the solution, you have to have extra energy, i.e. it takes a higher temperature to make things boil. So boiling point elevation is the second of our four colligative properties. And if you have a solution, the solution boils at a temperature higher than pure water, or the pure solvent would. So water, which is by far the most common, as you can probably tell, boils at 100. That would be like this point right here on the red line. But in a solution, you start adding the solutes, well, those molecules don't get into the gas phase as easy. The solute's blocking them. So it takes extra energy, i.e. a higher temperature, to make the solution boil relative to the solute. And the way that you can talk about boiling point elevation, delta T equals K times M. This is the little m, this is the molality, which is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And K is just a constant. So this is a table down here. Uh, there's boiling point constants and there's freezing point constants, and it does depend on your solvent. So for water, the boiling point constant is about 0.51. Make sure that you're using a boiling point constant and not a freezing point constant. We'll see that here in a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> I will give you all those values, man. Good. So you don't have to memorize those constants. That's a really good question. Okay. Well, how do we use this, Dr. Russell? Yeah, I know, whatever. Anyway, so this is an example of how this process works. Let's say we have an ethylene glycol water solution in our car, and you want to know what the boiling point of the solution is, all right? Well, the K value, which I will absolutely give you, as Donovan said, 0.512. The units of K are always weird. It's usually degrees Celsius per molal, or little m. Uh, don't let that bum you out or anything. So to solve for this, delta T equals K times M. And again, on Friday, we saw how the molality of this set of conditions was 4.00 molal. So if you use that from Friday, 4.00, which is M, we are given the K value right there. You just literally plug and chug. And the delta T here of this boiling point solution, 2.05 Celsius. Now here's the kind of weird part. If water normally boils at 100, which it does, we would add this delta T to it to figure out the delta T of the, or the temperature of your solution. So this solution will boil at 102.05 degrees Celsius. Just a little bit more than regular water, but it is enough to make a difference sometimes, and there's some really cool things you can calculate here. So what we did, we took the moles of ethylene glycol, divided it by the kilograms of solvent. One divided by 0 0.250 was where this four number came from. Multiply molality by the K, which I'll give you, like Donovan said, to get a delta T. That's the amount that the boiling point will go up. Boiling points always go up. So if your uh, solvent boils at 100 normally, you add that to it, 102.05. Questions. Okay. Freezing point is similar to boiling point, but while boiling points will go up, the freezing points will go down. It's the same process. The solute, the little yellow molecules here on the right, are preventing the, salt, the liquid from doing what it has to do. Now, with boiling, it was liquid going to gas. With freezing, it's liquid going to solid, and they also block that process. So it's harder for the liquid molecules to get into the solid phase. You have to lower the temperature down so that freezing can begin. So I'm gonna show you some videos here. It shows pure versus solution on the right, and it's supposed to be water. <laughs> but as you can tell from my uh, thing down here, uh, this shows water being more dense than liquid water. Why is that a problem? Oh. 
Because it floats. Because it floats, that's right. Yeah, you put an ice cube in, you don't want to have it sink. Maybe you do, but it doesn't normally do that. All right, so my video is, is kind of lame here, but the idea is legit, so bear with me here. When water freezes, its molecules leave the liquid phase and attach to other molecules in the solid phase. At the freezing point, an equal number of molecules move into and out of the solid phase. A solution of ethylene glycol, automobile antifreeze, has a freezing point lower than that of pure water. Molecules of the solute block the interface between the solid and liquid phases, thus decreasing the rate at which molecules leave the liquid phase and attach to the solid. So solutes are really troublesome when it comes to solvents in these solutions. And again, all these things we're talking about are solution based. When it comes to boiling, the solute blocks the liquid going to gas, makes it have a higher boiling point. When it comes to freezing, it blocks the liquid going to the solid. So you have to freeze it down a little bit more, make those solutes less blockers, uh, less capable of blocking to make it happen. So freezing points go down, boiling points go up, and like we saw, vapor pressures of solutions are lower than the vapor pressures of the pure solvents. So this is another, this is basically the same data I showed just a little bit ago, but the difference is we're focusing now on the freezing point. So water normally at one atmosphere freezes about zero Celsius, but when you have a solution, all right, that solute is blocking the solvent. So the freezing point becomes a lot less usually than the freezing point of the pure solvent. The equation is almost identical. It's delta T equals K times M. M is molality. K is a freezing point constant. Uh, it's also based on solvent. So for example, water we saw earlier here, it's 0.51, I think it was 0.512 or something earlier. Here's the freezing point version. So water freezes at zero, KF is 1.86. So again, none of these are numbers you have to know. You'll have them given to you and stuff, but uh, just realize you should pick the correct one. Cool. So here's an example of how this works. Same solution as before, the ethylene glycol water solution. It had a molality of 4.00 molal. We have a freezing point constant, 1.86. We want to see what the new freezing point is. Now, what is the freezing point of pure water? Zero. Zero, that's right. If you're at normal conditions, water freezes at zero Celsius. So in this case, we're going to find a delta T of 7.44, all right? But here's the trick. Freezing points are lower than the pure solvents they come from. So if you get 7.44, make sure you subtract it from the zero number. So this solution freezes at minus 7.44. Boiling points go up, freezing points go down. The delta T, as you can see here, comes out to be a positive number. Make sure that you subtract it. Now, in some books, you will see negative KFP values. So if you have a negative minus 1.86 number, that naturally comes out to be minus 7.44, and then you add it. And both ways are fine. You'll see books both ways. Uh, most of our books have positive Ks, so just remember to subtract it at the end. Uh, that's a little confusing. Chemists haven't quite figured out the best way to present this, in my opinion. But at the end of the day, just remember that freezing points will be lower than the solvents they come from. Okay, now, all the examples we've done so far have been covalent bonds, ethylene glycol, acetone, uh, iodine, and, and CCL4 is, is closer to that. Uh, but there's a little bit of a difference when you have an electrolyte. Now, electrolytes aren't just the things you find in Gatorade, all right? Electrolytes are ions, ions and solutions. And ions happen when you have ionic compounds. So in this example, we're going to look at how much sodium chloride has to be dissolved in four kilograms of water to lower the freezing point by 10 degrees. Uh, so again, to start this problem, delta T equals K times M. We want to have K be 10 degrees less, so 10 is fine. We know that the freezing point constant for water is this 1.86. 
So the molality, 5.38. If you have a negative K or a positive K, it doesn't really matter. But at the end of the day, molality is like molarity, which is like mass and moles, never negative, all right? Chemists, uh, including myself, love science fiction, but we can't handle negative mass under any circumstances. So all of these numbers will always be positive. So if you end up with a negative 5.38, just absolute value it, all right? Because you can't have negative mass, whatever you do. So at this point, this is the molality that we need to make the freezing point go down by 10 degrees. But what that means, remember, is we need that many particles running around in solution. Now, what happens when sodium chloride gets placed in water? Does it stay together or does it break apart? Good, I see a couple of you doing it. Yes, oh yes, you're so, I didn't get excited here. Yeah, ionic compounds dissociate in water, all right? So the reason you could put electricity in and the light bulbs go on and stuff is due to this process. Covalent bonds just stay together, but NaCl, for example, would break up to Na plus and Cl minus. You get two pieces per mole of NaCl that goes in. And that's important because we want to know not what it is. We don't care if it's sodium chloride or potassium bromide necessarily. We want to know how many pieces we have running around in solution. And so in theory, one mole of sodium chloride would create two moles of particles. You'd have one Na plus and one Cl minus for every one mole of NaCl. So ionic compounds, we have to take into account how much they dissociate. So because of this factor, because we get two particles per NaCl, all right, we can rethink about our thing a little bit. We saw it was 5.38 moles per kilogram, but there are two particles per mole. So in that case, we really only need 2.69 moles of potassium chloride, so thanks for playing, sodium chloride per kilogram. And if you do the math, convert it over using four kilograms, that means we need 629 grams of sodium chloride. So what happened in the old days, all right, is that people were using acetone and ethanol and things that were covalent. And one mole of dissolved stuff gave you one mole of particles. Everything was great. But then someone thought, well, let's use sodium chloride. Cool. But they would put in twice this amount of NaCl. Instead of going down minus 10, it would go down like minus 20. It went down a lot more than what they realized. So long story short, ionic compounds dissociating, super important when it comes to freezing points and boiling points. And the person that figured this out was a person named Van Hoft. And Van Hoft is someone's name that we'll kind of see lots of times. Van Hoft factor is just how many particles, how many ions you get for a mole of compound. And we're going to assume it's theoretical, so if you have NaCl, you always get two particles. Or if it was MgNO32, magnesium nitrate, you'd get three particles. Whatever it is, we're going to assume that it's 100% dissociation. In the real world, you don't always see that, but in our world, we will. So for example, NaCl we saw was an Na plus and a Cl minus, two ions, so the I value is two. We're going to assume that calcium chloride would be the same way. It would break up into a calcium two plus and two Cl minuses, three particles per calcium chloride. But anything organic, all right, caffeine, ethylene glycol, water, eth not water, well water I guess, pure water, ethanol, um, all of these things would have just a theoretical value of one. They don't have positives and negatives like the ionic compounds do. For our purposes, these I factors are only for ionic compounds. So. <clears throat> This is a question which I want you to think about here a little bit. It says, which solution is expected to have the higher boiling point, all right? Now, delta T equals K times M times I. K depends on the solvent, and the solvent is water, so that's not a factor. So the next part over M, that's these numbers right here. 
So just looking at these numbers, you'd think, well, sugar here has 0.15, that's bigger than 0 0.10. So that would make you think that what, that sugar would have a higher boiling, uh, higher boiling point. Uh, this sugar solution would have a higher boiling point than the sodium chloride. But there's also I. All right, now sugar is big and covalent. It doesn't break up into positives and negatives, but NaCl absolutely does. What's the I factor for NaCl in these kind of solutions? Two, that's right, yeah. You're gonna get an Na plus and a Cl minus. So K is the same, M is right here. I is one for sugar because it's covalent. I is two for NaCl. So 0 0.10 times two is greater than 0.15 times one. We would expect based on this stuff that the NaCl would be higher, all right? Gotta take into account those I factors. Any questions on that? The biggest use of freezing point and melting point, in my opinion, is through finding the molar mass. Now, chemists love to have ways to find the molar mass of compounds. Someone brings you an unknown compound and they, you want to know what it is, one of the things you need is molar mass. Now, we saw the molar mass of the volatile liquid lab, that if you can vaporize your stuff, uh, you can do it that way. But if you can't vaporize your unknown compound, that doesn't work too well. So freezing point and boiling point are great ways also to find molar mass. Uh, it's a much wider range of compounds that can be found, and that's going to be the, fo the focus of uh, t this week's lab and stuff. We'll use this and stuff to find it. Um, molar mass, it's, it's important to remember what your solute is and your solvent is. And in this problem right here, the molar mass of azolene, azolene is going to be our solute. And so what's happening here is we're putting this much azolene in 99 grams of benzene. So in this problem, benzene is the solvent and azolene is the solute. So this is the boiling point for benzene, the boiling point constant, 2.53. Normally, benzene boils 80.100 degrees Celsius. But in the presence of azolene, it actually goes up to 80.230 degrees Celsius. It's not a lot, but this is something that we could actually measure here at Mount Hood if we wanted to. We can use this information to find the molar mass of this compound, azolene. So what we're gonna do, this is a, temp, this is a boiling point problem. We'll use delta T equals K times M. Delta T is literally the difference between the solution, which is higher, and then the pure solvent, which is this one. So it's a pretty small amount, 0 0.130 degrees Celsius. But that equals K, this number, times M. So we'll solve for molality. So you can see here's delta T. We're dividing it by the K, which as Donovan asked about, is definitely something that will be given to you. This number, 0 0.0514, is the molality of your solution. Molality is a type of concentration. It's moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So for this problem, that would be moles of uh, azolene divided by kilograms of benzene. And if you look at this problem, we know how much benzene we had, 99 grams. So if you turned uh, 99 grams into kilograms, you get this number right here. Multiply it by the molality from the last step. The kilograms are gone. This is the moles of the azolene. And this is the grams of azolene we use to get this many moles. So molar mass, 0 0.640 divided by this weird number, 127 grams per mole, right? And again, the utility of this is that it works for a lot more kinds of compounds than the vapor pressure uh, or the molar mass of the volatile liquid did. That's very specific. You have to have an unknown that's gonna boil under the water as easiest and stuff like that. This works for all kinds of stuff. Now, if you don't like this stepwise behavior, uh, and you know I like quick and dirty equations, the molar mass equals grams of solute times the K value, 
and you divide it by the delta T and the kilograms of solvent. So the grams of solute is 0 0.640, the K is this 2.53, the delta T 0 0.130, and the kilograms of solvent, this number right here. And if you have all those values <coughs> on lab today, then you could plug it in with one step equation without going through all these individual steps. Either way is fine, just another possibility. Question. The membrane of an egg is semi-permeable and holds a high concentration of dissolved protein. When the egg is in pure water, osmotic pressure causes water to flow into the egg and it swells. In highly concentrated sugar solution, the solute concentration is higher in the sugar water than in the egg. Now osmotic pressure causes water to flow out of the egg. Osmosis is the last of our colligative properties, but I think it's the most interesting. Um, at the beginning on Friday, I showed how an egg, if you put it in vinegar, the hard shell actually goes away, it disintegrates. And then if you take that shellless egg and you put it either in pure water or corn syrup, a totally different thing happens. So in pure water, the egg gets bigger, all right? So look at this volume of this versus the original egg. It got a lot, of, uh, lot bigger. The water is rushing into the egg area. On the other hand, in corn syrup, you can see that what's left of this little egg thing here is a lot smaller than the egg that happened. So what's happening here is osmosis. And it's the solvent that's running around like crazy. Here, the water is running into the egg. But here, the water that's in the egg is running out of it. And we'll be able to understand what the heck's going on by looking at osmosis. Now, osmosis and osmotic pressure are the same thing. People would interchange those two concepts, but they are the same phenomena like we'll talk about. Now, again, Osmosis is a factor of the solvent in a solution. It's not really so much the solute, but to see what's happening with osmosis, let's pretend that we have like a separation in a, in a U-tube, if you will, where we have a semi-permeable membrane. And we're gonna say that the membrane only allows the usually smaller solvent molecules to go back and forth. So on one side, we have pure solvent, pure water, for example, and on the right side, we have a solution. It could be the egg with that out the shell. It could be sodium chloride, doesn't really matter. Now, this is a really wild thing, but there is a force in nature that tries to make everything the same. And in this problem, in this type of analysis, the solvent rushes to the solution. And how I visualize it is Mother Nature wants a concentrated solution to become more dilute, all right? It doesn't go to total dilution, but it goes down a lot. And this is just a force of nature. It has to do with entropy. And entropy is a really cool subject that we're gonna hit in Chem 223. If I start talking about it right now, I'll go off on a million different ways. It's really, really fascinating, but I'm just gonna tease you with that name for right now. However, the important part for you right now is that if you have a pure liquid and a solution, that pure liquid is gonna rush to the side of the solution, all right? You don't see, you see some some liquid go backwards, but almost all of it is one direction. When a solution of higher concentration and a solution of lower concentration are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, one through which solvent molecules can pass but through which solute particles cannot, solvent molecules will pass through the membrane from the side containing the more dilute solution to the side containing the more concentrated solution. This process is called osmosis. Solvent molecules actually move through the membrane in both directions, but because the concentration of the solvent is higher on the right, solvent molecules on the right collide with the membrane more frequently than on the left, resulting in a net flow of solvent from right to left. So, uh 
the solute molecules are usually either big organic things like ethylene glycol or they're ions that are hydrated, ion dipole force. So the solute's usually bigger. If you took away this barrier, you just mix everything together and it would be just one solution. All right, that's not what's happening here. Here we have some kind of a barrier. All right, it's not super effective, obviously, because stuff's getting through both ways, but the stuff that's getting through is solvent, all right? And what Mother Nature does, and it's, again, this is one of those things that I can explain, but I can't really talk about the why, because it seems weird. Solvent flows to the side that's more concentrated. In this example, you had a more concentrated and a less concentrated, or it was more concentrated and less concentrated. And the solvent on the more concentrated side always goes to the less concentrated side. So pure solvent would rush to a solution, or more concentrated, less concentrated, less concentrated stuff goes to the other side. So at the end of the day, if the liquids were even initially, the one side goes up. And you can measure this as a length, all right? And it's length in millimeters of mercury, which hopefully sounds a lot like pressure because 760 millimeters of mercury equals a pressure. So solutions will have a pressure exhibited on them if you have pure water placed outside. And you can measure it from the height up to the top of the column. As we talked about with pressure, the it begins to pull down, the solution can only go up so far, but it literally is a measurable pressure. It would be like millimeters of mercury usually, which isn't like a, a big distance, but it is something that can be measured, and the results are just incredible. So osmotic pressure, which gets the symbol pi, and this is not 3.1416, et cetera, et cetera. Osmotic pressure is a pressure on the solution, all right? The solution is actually experiencing it. It's becoming less dilute. The solvent's moving inside. It's totally wild, but it's a pressure of the solution. It's not a pressure of the gas, all right? It's a pressure of the solution itself, which is just totally weird. Now the equation that's used to describe osmotic pressure, pi equals I CRT. And pi, once again, is the osmotic pressure. It, because we're using R, 0 0.082057, we're gonna use atmospheres for it. But it is the pressure, but it's not a pressure of a gas, it's a pressure of a solution. And osmotic pressure is dependent on the Kelvin temperature. Here's our good friend R. Now you can probably imagine this looks a little bit like PV equals NRT, but we're at C, oh, but the moles over volume is concentration. For solutions, it makes more sense to use molarity here. So molarity is the type of unit used with osmotic pressure. And then if you have an ionic compound, you've got to take into account that Van Hoff factor as well. So in the covalent molecules, I would just be one. But NaCl, which breaks up into Na plus and Cl minus, I would be two. Osmotic pressure was just another one of the colligative properties for a long time. But man, in biochemistry, there's been a lot of use of osmosis, which has been kind of a surprise. So one reason why we're talking about this is for biochemistry. We're gonna see that a lot of the huge molar mass proteins and stuff like that, they can figure out the molar mass pretty readily. A more practical reason though, is that as drinkable water becomes more of a premium, Reverse osmosis is a process used to take seawater and turn it into drinking water. We won't talk a lot about reverse osmosis, but it's kind of like the opposite. You're forcing the solvent from the solution into the pure so it can be drank, which is really fascinating too, so. When a solution and a pure solvent are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, solvent can flow in both directions, but the solute cannot. Here, pure water moves into the solution, working to bring both the solution and pure water to the same concentration. This process, osmosis, continues until the flow of water across the membrane is balanced by the pressure exerted by the water column. A semi-permeable membrane blocks solute molecules, but allows solvent molecules to pass in both directions. The number of solvent molecules moving from the solution side to the pure solvent side is less than the number moving into the solution side, resulting in a net flow into the solution. 
Again, it's totally wild why this happens. Um, the ionic compounds are hydrated, so they get bigger. The big, uh, most of the other solutes, the covalent ones, are usually bigger molar mass. So the theory is they don't get through the membrane, but little tiny solvents do. And water is a pretty small molecule overall, so they get through. And again, the net result is that the pure water goes to the solution. It makes the concentration of your solution go down, all right? But in the process, then, you end up getting a measurable pressure that you can measure in millimeters of mercury, turn into atmospheres, all that kind of stuff. Now, here's an example of something that I saw in a biochemistry thing a while ago. Um, we've got a hemoglobin solution, and hemoglobin is just one of these huge proteins. But anyway, they're taking 35 grams of hemoglobin, and they're placing it into a liter total of solution. And you measure the, the osmotic pressure, pi, and it comes out to be 10 millimeters of, at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, 10 millimeters is a centimeter. It's a very small amount, but it is something that's measurable, all right? You place this in water, and all of a sudden, bam, your pressure goes up. It's totally wild. You can use this information to find the molar mass. So if you do it, turn your millimeters of mercury into atmospheres. We saw that there's 760 millimeters of mercury in an atmosphere, so that's a very small 0.0132 atmospheres, no problem. But from here now, 0.132 is the, is the osmotic pressure. We're gonna divide by RT. Remember, R is a number you should know slash memorize, 0.082057. Kelvin temperatures, anytime you've got R involved, 298. The concentration that you get is 5.40 times 10 to the minus four moles per liter. Now, in this example, we had one liter of solution. So if you multiply it by one, you get just 5.40 times 10 to the minus four moles. So the molar mass now is gonna be the grams of the solute, hemoglobin, divided by the moles that you have, and you do that, and you get just crazy high numbers. Now to me, a high molar mass is like 400 grams per mole, <laughs> 64,800, like blowing my brain here big, but anyway, this is one of the places that's really cool. Uh, the big molar mass compounds, if you throw them into freezing point boiling points, they don't have a very big delta T. But with osmotic pressure, they do have a more manageable and measurable uh, value. And so that's why a lot of times the biochemists like this process better. So. All the fun things you can do with solutions. So kind of summarizing, all right? We've got four new concentration units, plus that weird parts per million, but we won't talk about that very much. Mole fraction, moles of whatever you're looking at divided by total moles. X, chi, excuse me, is always a number between zero and one. And that's used in vapor pressure lowering Rhodes law, all right? Weight percent, mass percent, grams of A divided by total grams times 100. This is just used in lab a lot, all right? And it's important to know about it, but there isn't like a specific clegative property there. But molality, there certainly is. Molality is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And molality is used in boiling point elevations and elevation and freezing point lowering. Uh, very, very important, we'll use that today in lab. And then finally now in osmosis, we're back to molarity. Molarity is moles of solute over liters of solution. Osmosis is super important. Questions? Okay. The rest of the material in this chapter is more informational. So honestly, you've gotten through the parts that are really critical to problem set five, but I think it's important to talk about these things. Um, if you've ever had a medical procedure at a hospital, they hook you up to a bag and stuff like that with some kind of solution in it. And if they use pure water in the bag to inject you with, all your cells would burst because the more concentrated goes to the less concentrated. They start putting water in and that would be bad news. Or So anyway, um, the solutions have to be isotonic. They have to have some kind of ionic compound to replicate blood. I think this is a 
sodium chloride, sometimes potassium chloride. But uh, yeah, if they ever want to put pure water in, just be a little careful, man, because your cells will start bursting. And again, I'm not a biologist, medical person by any means, but uh, these are kind of cool uh, things that can happen. You want to have the flow of the ions be the same, the water molecules be the same, all right? They call them isotonic. So the water in the cell goes out, the water outside of the cell goes in, and it's the same rate, like back and forth. However, you can have hypertonic, and that means then that more of the inside cell waters are going out than water going in, and that collapses the cell down to a smaller one. But you can also have hypotonic, all right? That's if you have essentially like pure water on the outside. The water's going to rush in trying to make the cell the same concentration. They get really, really big, so not good for the human body either way, as you can probably imagine. Uh, Reverse osmosis is so important these days. Uh, this was something that was like kind of a once in a while thing, but now in the Middle East and even down in Los Angeles, they have huge desalination plants. Uh, Seawater is everywhere, but water that you can drink is becoming more rare. And so what they'll do is they pressurize a seawater solution. So this side on the right there is all seawater. You wouldn't want to drink it, of course, it's got lots of stuff in it. But as you pressurize, it forces the water molecules to go to the pure side. It's the opposite of osmosis. It doesn't happen normally, but you do get water out. And apparently they have like tanks and tanks and tanks of this all set up so they can create drinkable water and stuff like that. Okay, questions on that? All right, so on Wednesday, I'm going to show you a few more slides about other kinds of solutions. But today, now we talk about all the critical things for today. We'll go over this more course on the problem set. Thanks for being here. See you this afternoon.